Welcome to Hashtag Ambitious. In this episode, we have Keith Henshaw, the Managing Director of the Leather Satchel Company. The Leather Satchel Company make and sell the most beautiful leather bags and leather goods. It's a truly unique British business. All the bags are designed and made here in Liverpool, England. The story of the Leather Satchel Company began 50 years ago, when Steve Henshaw started on his leathercraft journey. The company has remained in the family since and is now directed by Keith Hanshaw. Keith's story is an interesting one. Keith is highly intelligent and an experienced businessman. He's managed to bring the Leather Satchel Company into the modern world, but at the same time keep all the heritage of the business. He's taken all his experience of working in the corporate world and combined this with his creativity to make a global boutique business. Keith, I just want to say thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. I really, really appreciate it. More than welcome. It's an honour. Your story is on your website. It's very much in detail and you can find it, but it's such a rich story of entrepreneurship, creativity, British manufacturing history. It'd be rude not to ask you if you could share it with those who, who might not know it. Right, okay. It's quite long. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to move <laughs> so we don't send everyone to sleep. <laughs> um, so, I mean, it, it's a family business. You know, this is what our family do. So our, our family got into leather work from my granddad originally, who was taught basic equipment repair during the Second World War. And who he was taught by was, unfortunately enough, to die during the Second World War. So after the war, he kept leather craft as a hobby, mm. as a way of remembering his lost kind of comrade wow. do you know what I mean yeah. so we then go back to kind of 19 late mid to late 50s and my uncle Stephen who's living in Portland Road in Liverpool with my nan and granddad he's the eldest of seven so my mum my, it's my mum's brother yeah um he's always I mean he's really kind of me and him are quite similar. Okay. We're quite artistic and crafty, but we're also, I would say, a little bit business people as well, which yeah. is unusual for craftspeople and artists to be, you know? Um, and everyone tells me that, you know? So he comes home one day, and he, he's, he's like a young teenager. He's like 12, 13. And my granddad's making a belt in the kitchen on a wooden worktop, and he's like... Uncle Stephen comes home and he's like, what are you doing, Pops? Pops is what we call me granddad. Yeah. yeah? His dad. Yeah. What are you doing, Pops? Making a belt. Oh, wow. And like, Uncle Stephen has never really seen him do anything like this. Like, he used to make his own belts and straps mm. and do a little bit. It's hobby craft. It's not professional work. Yeah. But Steve's like, and I think granddad at that moment, Stephen, I've spoken to Steve about this moment and he says like, it was like a magical moment. It was like, I th we discussed it in depth and we said, do you think Pops kind of thought it was a way to pass on the spirit? Mm. You know, of what he was trying to help remember and keep alive. Yeah. And it was, he says, yeah, there is something in that. And then there's that father son link. You know, he's my dad and he wants to teach me stuff. Yeah. And then I look up to him and there's all this kind of magic going on. And it was, it, we, we talk about it as a magical moment, mm. you know, and it's like, so Steve picks, he teaches him how to make a belt. He makes his own, you know, granddad's making a new belt and he teaches him how to make a belt. So Uncle Steve, like that moment, hooked on leather craft, absolutely loves it. Everything's like, ah, oh, what are we making next, Pops? You know, and he's buying stuff and he's making stuff and he's like a kid, yeah. you know, and he's like 12, 13. So years go on, he's getting better, and he's good with his hands, he is good with his hands, he's incredibly dexterous, he's like, you know, he's, you see him now, it's like things he can do, it's just like, oh my God, how long did that take to learn, you know, and it's just like, you know, he's amazing. Um, and he gets to like 16, 15, and he's about to leave school, and back then, it's like, you know, you're thinking, just a turn it like Stephen was born in 40 I think late 46 early f or maybe yeah I can't even remember his birthday I'm terrible <laughs> I'm terrible with dates <laughs> Me too. I'm terrible with yeah 
Um, so 46, 47. Yeah. So if you're thinking he's leaving school at 16, you're probably looking at what, 62, 63? Like the start of the Beatles and all that going on in Liverpool. There's all kinds happening. It's exciting. There's change happening. People are being a bit more adventurous. And the school are asking him, which factory do you want to go and work in? Yeah. And he's like, you know, he always jokes. He says, nudely said to me, you know, yeah, so how's that work? And he goes, oh, 40 hours a week, 40 bob. 40 years of your life, retiring 40% of your pay. And he just went, you're having a laugh, aren't you? Yeah. Because at the time, he was doing hobby craft, but he was also making stuff for people. So he was doing, he had like a pot, what I call like nowadays, like an Etsy business. Mm. You know, a little kind of hobby craft business, running from home, not a really a professional standard, yeah. but good enough for people to encourage and and to allow people to develop the time and hone the skill, you know? And it was kind of, he's selling like belts and shoes and things to, well, more like belts, leather straps was one of his biggest sellers because back then, razor blades were really, really, they still are now, really, really expensive. Yeah. You know, it was like, so everyone had cutthroat razors and they'd sharpen them themselves. Yeah. And that, that device to sharpen it was leather. You know, and it was like, so be making that for people making belts. Can you make this pair, Steve? I'll have a go. Yeah. And, and that's what he did. So, it, and he was in, he's a young lad, so he's encouraged by family. And we got a massive family. Mm. You know, the Hanshaw's a huge family. Um, and so everyone's been encouraging him, and he's making money. He's making a few bob. Mm. And he's like, oh, man, I was nearly making that part time, like, and going to school. Yeah. It's like, I wasn't going to go into full time work. And, take a little step up. He just thought, I could do more leather work. Mm. So basically, he, he ended up getting some metal stamps and he'd, he'd cut little squares of leather with Hanshaw's, and he'd stamp Hanshaw's leather into them with his phone number, 051-228-6628. I know that because we've still got some. <laughs> 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 and, um, and it's still me nan's number now. Mm. So it's, it's, it's kind of... Oh, wow. Yeah. So Stephen... Wrote, did these like little leather business cards and he used to knock on all the neighbours door like hello it's Steve from number 98 <laughs> I've got I, I, I've, I've started a little business doing leather work give him a business card and then he said I'd do belts do this do that he'd show him a few things you know what I mean next door da, da, da. oh I need a new belt yeah you know and, and, yeah. and that's and how the business grew basically Working door to door, knocking, showing what he could do, Amazing. getting orders. So then he converted the outhouse in Portland Road, which was, a, there was a shed and an outhouse. Well, obviously it wasn't used anymore, but he converted that into a little leather workshop. That's still there now. Yeah. Um, we don't use it anymore. I mean, it's all rusted and there's big like sleepers and stuff that is used for a bench and stuff like that. And he used to, he turned that into a little leather workshop where he used to make stuff. So he's working from home doing stuff. <clears throat> and then eventually what he did is he then swapped from making leather goods into working in front of people. And we tried to work out when this moment was. Mm. So from working it, making leather goods in this little workshop into deciding, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to make in front of people. So we've, we've, I've spoke to Steve about this. And there was a, what we think is he's buying more leather. Because it's like trying to be an archaeologist, trying to uncover the history, mm. my involvement in that. It's like, you know, and, and piecing it all together afterwards and yeah. how that all winds together. And you, oh, that's because of that and that's because of that. And it's really, really interesting. So Steve is buying more ladder. He's getting that local, mm. like, like round the corner, you know, back then it's like corners. I can remember on the corner of me nan's road on um, Derby Lane, there used to be a dairy. They used to have about 12 cows. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I used to have to stop playing footy in the street because they'd, they'd drive <laughs> the cows home to the dairy, you know, and then they'd take them out to the fields every morning. <laughs> and, that. and it was like, it's just mental, you know, and that, that's like, that's like 70s, you know, and that's not that long ago. Mm. Really ecologically friendly, everything done locally, small scale, you know, it, and it, it's like you look at like what we had and what we've lost. There's a, there's a whole other conversation there. Yeah. But anyhow, mm. so he's buying leather locally. He's got the, getting these big hides taking them home he's in this little farty workshop that's no bigger than a good table <laughs> and he's like how are you gonna work with that on there so he thinks he's taking it 
into the yard and started working there. But occasionally, my nan's washing lines would have been ab- across <laughs> the yard. And we're thinking, there's going to be times when he's not going to be able to use that space. Yeah. So he's taken them out the front of the house, which is, it's a, it's a terraced house, you know. Mm. It, it goes onto the street, you know. So the front of the house is a pavement. Yeah. Yeah. So he says, what I started was, I, sta- I started there and I was cutting bell planks out. So he's cutting bell planks with a thing called a strap cutter. Mm. And it's an, an ingenious little device that cuts a perfect width of leather off a, off a hide. Yeah. It's really interesting. He says, I'm cutting that and these guys are going past. And they're asking like, what are you doing, lad? Just cutting some belts. You make belts? Yeah. You make me one. And it's like this conversation happens where yeah. he realises when he makes stuff in front of people and shows them what he can do, that he doesn't have to explain and go marketing himself mm-hmm. because people are seeing it yeah. and they see what he's doing and they love that. It's very authentic and transparent. And it's like, and he makes sales. So then he, 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 he forgets the workshop, you know, and he starts working in, in front of the house and it's like, one Saturday comes and he gets no orders. Mm. And normally he's getting like three, four orders. Yeah. You know, people walking past, well, yeah, I can make that. Yeah, I can do this. And he's still got like this network of people who've got his business cards. And then obviously anyone who buys one gets a leather business card and mm. all that kind of stuff. And you know, they'll pin it to a notice board or keep it by the phone or whatever, you know. So the business is growing. But then... He's like, he's coming in, and, and, and I remember Nan and Grandad. I mean, he's like, he's like 17, 18, you know, he's young. Wow. And, but he's good. Yeah. You know, he's been doing his trade for like five, six years already. You know, so it's like you think about where he is at this young age. I mean, he's, you know, he's an artisan at this point. Never mind where he is now. Yeah. You know, but, and he's coming in, and Nan and Grandad said, he was like, he was so downhearted. Because he had no orders, he thought, what's going on? It's like, you know, and he said, where is everyone? There's been no one around. Mm. And it's like, you've normally got people like, guys going here and doing that and buying belts and stuff. Everywhere, there's a derby match in Liverpool. (laughs) (laughs) Everyone's at the match. (laughs) (laughs) So, you and I probably go, okay, yeah, it'll be fine next week. Mm, mm. not Uncle Stephen this is his whole mentality is just like any certain problem how can I solve it let's go and do it picks up a bag gets some tools gets a hide of leather rolls it up puts it under his arm gets on the bus heads down to Anfield all the crowds are in there gets ready set up for when they come out and starts making stuff people come out what are you doing I'm making belts aren't I Put Liverpool on it if you want. <laughs> With a hammer, a hammer in Liverpool in and all so LFC clever. onto things. Gets 20 orders. He's there for three hours after the match. Wow. People buzzing around in the pubs and stuff. Gets 20 orders off that day. He's like, oh my God, this is insane. That's like a week's work off like a couple of hours at an event. So it clicks with him. And he's like, I've got to get to events. I've got to go to where the people are. Yeah. And I've got to just, I just start making them. There's no laws then. You could, he just used to like carry a big sheet of suede. Suede's basically unfinished leather. Mm. It's been brushed to give it a nice effect. He'd put suede out, put a load of product up, and then he'd have a portable workshop. I've got some pictures of them as well. There's some pictures of them on the work, on, wow. on the website as well, of him working in that, that environment and where it all started. Wow. Still got the same, he used to have a portable sewing machine. Big heavy thing, weighs about 25 kilos. Still got that. That's in the workshop. Still works. We still use it today. Wow. Um, and he basically used to make stuff, sew stuff, cut stuff, and then he'd have a display of his work in front, just set up on a pavement, wherever it was, wherever was going on, music, festival, sport, and events, anything. He'd go right and going there, and I'm doing that, and that's that was his business. It was it was the it was the if you like the seed of a pop-up shop, yeah. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. That's what we call a pop-up shop nowadays. I mean, we're doing very different now. And you need licenses and all kinds nowadays to do that kind of street mm. trading. But back then, it was a lot more open, a lot more free, a lot more kind of entrepreneurial. Um, it looks like you've kept that tradition, though. Well, that's part of what the company is about, is yeah. being true to our heritage, you know. So where we are now, we make in front of people. Mm. We do pop-up shops. We go to where the people are rather than where, you know, um, okay, we've got a shop on the Albert Dock. Yeah. 
that's very different. But the people down here, they're all new people all the time. So the yeah. exposure for us is brilliant because you're getting so many people from all over the world, which is great for us because I'd like to think, even though we're a boutique brand, we're a global boutique mm. brand. You know, we're not massive, but we're known all over the world. I mean, I, I was, I, I've, I've been in, you know, I've been in France at a trade show and seen someone with one of our bags. Wow. And it's like, it's so lovely. And then I took the kids to, um, we took the kids to Stonehenge the other week and there was a girl there with one of our bags on. It's like, Gail and I play bag spot, especially when in Liverpool. <laughs> we love it. <laughs> one nil. <laughs> Gail's a wife, by the way. But yeah. yeah, so we'll be in the, in, the, in the van or the car and we'll be playing bag spot and then like trying to get scores. <laughs> like, God, there's one with a pixie. Oh, someone's got a 12 and a half. It's actually over there. <laughs> do you go over to them or do you just keep. It did, if, if we're driving, obviously we can't yeah. do anything. But that, what, we, what we generally do is we'll, we'll tap them and we'll just go, oh, nice bag. <laughs> <laughs> and we see if they recognise us. Some of them recognise because yeah. we're, we're, we're in the shop a lot, especially for a weekend. Gail and I like to get front, front of line and we'll come in the shop. Yeah. You know, we like to deal with people, understand what their challenges are, what, you know, how best to help them yeah. choose the bag, what they want, explain the business and what we offer. And I think you can only do that when you're getting deep into the nitty gritty yeah. as well, you know what I mean? And it's all that, and that marketing message and that understanding of what people need is then translated into the website and everything yeah. like about that journey. Because our customer journey is really long. Okay. Generally, we find on the website, most people are spending around two to three weeks before they make a decision. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's a long customer journey. And there's a whole education process going on there. You know, the ordering leather swatches, the trying it out, the looking on this, the following Instagram and Facebook and looking at all the little bespoke projects we're making and go, oh, I like that. I wonder if they can do that in that colour with yeah. that little thing off that bag on that. And we're like, yeah, we can do that for you. So um, get, does it, when a customer buys a bag from you, it's less of a, an impulse purchase? Does it feel like an investment to them then? Mm. Does it become invested in your brand? And I think I, 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 I try to stay away from the word investment. Mm. Because it makes the bags seem expensive, yeah. and I don't think they are. They start, no, they're, they're they start at like fifty quid, and they go our most expensive bag off the shelf. I think is one hundred and ninety, yeah. which is for a bag that's guaranteed for five years, got a lifetime repair policy, yeah. handmade in Britain, real cowhide. It's like actually, I should be paying four times that price. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so we always try and be value, but that's the heritage of the brand and it's, it's like going back to where we were mm. it's about staying true to the heritage you know when uncle St so uncle steve started the business he was in london mm. 1966 world cup where's uncle steve gonna be obvious <laughs> outside wembley <laughs> <laughs> so he's he's like down the road from wembley because wembley was just too chocker so he's down the road yeah. in wembley headmaster walks past he doesn't know He's got this air of authority. Stephen says it was a scary moment. Mm. He's got this air of authority about him. Like, you know, some people just have that. Yeah. Yeah. And he's look he's picked up the school bag and he's inspecting it. And Steve thinks he's done something wrong. Steve thinks, well, maybe it's like a copyrighted design or something and I've, I've, I'm not allowed to because he's made some for yeah. people, you know, people say, Keith, can uh, Steve, can you make me a satchel? Mm. Yeah, I can do that. So he's got stuff on display, satchels, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And it's like, he, d he didn't know. The satchels, like, goes back to Shakespearean times, the exact shape and design. It's public domain, yeah. you know. Um, but this guy's looking at it, he goes, did you make this? He's like, uh, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, oh, okay. And, he, and he's like, oh, okay. And he's like, he keeps looking at it, he's tugging at it. He goes, is something wrong? He says, no. He says, oh, okay, would you like to buy it? And he says, no, I'd like to buy 200. <laughs> and it's like, it started the conversation of this chap ran, was a headmaster at a school, Coley Court in London, it's now Boutique Hotel. Mm. Um, Coley Court still exists, but I believe it's moved. Um, and this chap was, you know, I think he was having trouble finding a good quality satchel. He'd seen an amazing quality satchel yeah. from this young lad who was like 19 at the time. You know, and it was like, Stephen had bought a van. This is how he ended up in London. He'd bought a van, knocked the back of it, couldn't afford a Volkswagen camper, turned it into a camper van, 
so he could carry all this stuff and live away for a few days at a time. Wow. That's just mental, isn't it? I mean, who does that? You know, it's like, it's just like, what? <laughs> you know, converted your own van at like 18, 19. You know, and it's like, oh yeah, I'm just going to go go and live mm. in Wembley for four days or something and then I'll be back at the pick up some more leather and then I'll shoot down again and while the World Cup's on, it's yeah. just like, like sleeping in the back, workshop <laughs> on the road. You know, it's just like hippie traveller. <laughs> what? You know what I mean? It was just, that was him. That was him. You know, that, that was his like lifestyle. Advanced marketing for that time as well because we didn't have the internet then, did we? Mm. So, wow. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. Unbelievable. So the, so basically that started the conversation and the guy then wrote a letter of intent the letter of intent basically allowed him to go to the bank along with his pitch some other schools because it wasn't quite enough the deposit that he was going to leave for the satchels wasn't quite enough for him to get the business off the ground for what he wanted to do yeah. so he spoke to some other schools he's on the phone da, 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 da. god knows how many people he had to phone yeah. to but he, he basically got four letters of intent mm. that was enough to secure enough le leather to order all to make all the bags mm. and then put a deposit on a property in smith down road which was like i think at the time it was like two and a half grand or something <laughs> it's just like how much <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> can't even get a survey for that much now, <laughs> you know? like, right now. <laughs> yeah, it's just like yeah it's crazy but yeah and that basically was the start of the leather satchel co so that's stephen going from Hanshaw's or Hanshaw's leathers yeah to the leather satchel co and the leather satchel co just made satchels that's all it did nowadays okay. we have like 80 different styles of bags 60 different leathers we customize everything it's a very different business yeah but back then it was production okay you know it was it was like a mini production line they used to go right and his brothers joined him uncle barry uncle paul still in the business now yeah amazing leather workers the, the, my uncles are the guys who taught me yeah yeah you know so that's where that knowledge comes from wow and that's how I got into it. So every every handshaw cuts the teeth in in the handshaw's leather work, okay. you know. So it's like everyone does something, mm. you know. Be it you come in, you do this. It's like Saturdays, holidays. Like there's no one in our family, and there must be about sixty, seventy people of us. There's not, well, there's not one of us who doesn't work. Yeah. First off, we're lucky in that respect. You know, we're all fit and healthy mm -hmm. and. And we've all managed to find work and get jobs or work in the family business but everyone goes through and cuts the teeth it's saturday job it's like right come in do that do that that's what i started 14 yeah. right saturday job but just loved it <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know. so 16 i left school yeah you know my mum wanted me to go to college and, and uni and do fine art and stuff and i'm like no i'm gonna go and make leather goods with my uncle yeah. says you're not i'll never speak to you again <laughs> I'm like, oh gosh, <laughs> yeah, I know, but I am. So yeah, I mean, she speaks to me. You know, <laughs> but we did fall out. It's not the only thing we fell out with. Over the years, but, you know. well, I'm really interested you in your background because you have yeah. got a very, very interesting background, yeah. haven't you? So yeah, I'd love it if you could, if you, if you could. Yeah. Share so it. I started work. I, I left school, um, got some GCSEs, but never, no other qualifications. Left school, started work. Hmm. So did my apprenticeship under my own course. Yeah. yeah. Um, and loved it, absolutely loved it. Um, making all kinds of stuff, satchels, music cases, belts, guitar straps. So round about the time when I'm getting involved, we're, we've already been through the whole satchel journey. So yeah. the satchels have been really big. And then we've got to the kind of late 80s, uh, sorry, late 70s, early 80s, and satchels are dying out. Okay. So the business has diversified and gone back more to what Stephen used to do. Mm. So it, it's like making everything yeah. because we, we can make everything. It was just satchels was a really good market for us. And we diversified. So our core business was making belts and guitar straps. Um, we used to make clogs. We used to make, you know, we made clogs for Freddie Mercury. Anyhow, another story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Holy queen. So many questions yeah, yeah, are coming up. <laughs> we did guitar straps. You're not leaving here today, by the way. ACDC. Wow. We used to watch Top of the Pops and play Spot, Spot the Straps. Oh, top of the Pops. You just brought back childhood yeah. memory. <laughs> yeah, so we'd all sit around on Friday night watching the chart show and it'd be like, that's one of our straps. There's <laughs> another, <laughs> you know. We got, so it's, it's like, yeah, we, I mean, biggest ones for us was like Oasis. Oasis had our straps wow. as well. It was like, it was nice. It was nice. ACDC, Angus Young still uses them now. That you know? is. Yeah. So it's nice. Um,
But anyhow, that, so the business had already diversified. We're making all kinds mm. of things. And, <clears throat> but we're British made. Mm. And the, the challenge we have is we've always been competitively priced. Mm. So for what people were getting, we've always been price driven first. Uh, um, that was the main factor. So over the years, we got very, very good at being very, very efficient at making things. Like with the skill level we had, and even today, like most people, when they make a bag, they glue it together before they stitch it. Okay. So it holds its shape. We don't glue. Wow. We just stitch. Wow. Because it saves the process. It saves money. Yeah. It does a hell of a lot more skill, but we just found it, oh, that tech, you know, it's like, we have to do it. Mm -hmm. How can we save time? We've got to keep these costs low. So it's like, there's things we do <clears throat> that the competition or our competitors just can't do. Yeah. You know, it's like we make one-off bags at a price that they're doing production on mm -hmm. and strigg struggling to match our prices on. Yeah. You know, and we're making them one-off because we just cut into leather. It's like we don't have to do a pattern and a prototype and, oh, let's tweak this and let's tweak that. We're just like, yeah, get a hide of leather. What do you need? Foot in half in satchel. Right, okay. Mark that out. Bang. There you go. Cut wow. it. Stitch it. There you go. You know, and it's like we can do that because we've got the experience. That's what gives us a competitive edge in yeah. the market we are. We're the only bespoke satchel maker left in the UK. We were the only satchel maker left yeah. in the UK up until Harry Potter came along. Yeah. You know, so it's kind of... So, <clears throat> going back, product diversified, but we're driven by price, and it's getting harder and harder because ch as China opens up more and more and more, people are going, oh, you can go to China and get yeah. labor at 10p an hour. Mm. You know, and it's like, okay, how we compete? We can't compete with this. We can't compete with this. And the business struggled, really struggled. I can remember not being paid for six months. Wow. I took a pot wash job in a restaurant on a Wednesday, a Thursday, Friday, a Saturday to pay me bills. So I could come to work in the day and work for Uncle Barry. Wow. You know what I mean? So, but the business kept on. It's that grit. And it was everyone was like that. Yeah. We all struggled. And it was that grit that kept us going. That's why we were the last satchel maker, because we were family. Yeah. We can't go, right, okay, we're moving production to China. It's like, well, first of all, none of us could speak Mandarin. Yeah. <laughs> but you couldn't fire people because they were family. Yeah. It's like, you know. But it was still really, really hard. So it, it came to the point where I knew everyone was struggling. We didn't have the work for us all. Mm. And we're still struggling to pay all the wages and get by. So it was kind of like a time for me to say, hey, listen, Uncle Barry, you've all got families. Yeah. You know, there was, there was my Uncle Paul, my Uncle Barry, my Uncle Steve, another guy called Keith, who was basically helping Steve on the road, sell product, going yeah. out in a van. We used to go round out in the van with all our leather goods to all the pet shops, all the music shops, everything. Go, do you need anything? Just hunting down work, just travelling around, knocking. Wow. Yeah, you know, and he'd have a route, and it worked. And Uncle Steve would do the same as well. And we still struggled, you know. And they got the product right there in front of them, like, yeah, no minimum. Do you want one strap? There you go. Do you yeah. want one belt? There you go. You know, that's great. Okay, next shop, let's see what we can get. And it was like, I don't mind going, you know. Mm. It's like, because I'd always wanted to pursue art, and I was really, it have been a hobby. I built my own computer when I was like 10. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's not like, I did go back and do microelectronics at a later date. Yeah. But not like, I bought circuit boards that piece together, you know. It's not, not like built it from scratch. Yeah. But for a 10-year-old. Yeah. Who's like investing like 900 pounds of his money, wow. <laughs> you know, and like, yeah, I'm going to build it myself because I can save 400 quid, mum. And she's <laughs> like, what if you get it wrong? <laughs> you know, and I'm like, I won't. I'll work it out. So I built my own computer and I learned, you know, I also learned to program. And so how so, did you learn to program? Well, back then, like, computer games were expensive. Mm. You know, it was like, they still are now, but they, they were expensive. And it was like, so you used to, you used to buy magazines, like me, you know, and... I mean, granddad then, he'd, re he'd semi-retired. He had a part-time job in a news agents. Mm. But he used to get me a magazine subscription. Yeah. He used to get me this thing called the Home Computer Club every week. Yeah. It had program listings in it. Wow. Yeah. And you have to type them in, you know. <laughs> that yeah. was how it was. You'd have like a thousand lines of code. And you'd be like, you'd be typing it in and you'd get it wrong. And then you'd be something wrong somewhere. You don't have to debug it. So you get basically get the understandings of why is that not working? Yeah. Why is this not working? And. 
so you learn how to program and then you know, I could do, oh, we could change this, I could make that do that. And they go, oh, well, look, that worked. I'd be like, well, I'm coming along. What, <laughs> what is it, Keith? Look, it's red now. <laughs> <laughs> it's only supposed to be green. <laughs> you know, just little things, you know. Wow. But, but then you're learning and, and then you start developing stuff and you're writing your own games and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, so I used to be big, big into adventure games and all that kind of stuff. So I used to write a lot of them and fun stuff and got into that. So anyhow, that's where my computer background okay. came. So I, I, I was in doing leather, loving the leather work. Yeah. Because creative, it's very satisfying as well. Oh, yeah. Especially when yeah. you're making something from start to finish. If you're just taking a little bit out of it in a production line, mm. the joy and the pride in the work goes. Yeah. Because it's not your product. You haven't got ownership of it. Yeah. When you take a piece of leather and you turn that into a bag or a belt, that you, that you put something, part of you is in that. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, it, Absolutely, yeah. There's a magic in it. You know, you've given a bit of you, yeah. your spirit, goes into that belt or that bag and then it's like you want it to live you want it to to last forever yeah do you know what i mean and, yeah 100%, and there's something yeah. magical in that Taking you know something from nothing to a finished product yeah 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 completely and i think i think people see that when they see our bags you know it's and the products we make they're like people come in the shop and you just the jaw goes like that they go oh my god look at this place mm. especially the bag lovers you know yeah and they're just like they're just like wow this is amazing Get people saying this is the best shop in Liverpool. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I'm like, it's not. Yeah, I'll take for, it. Yeah. For a bag lover, it might be. You know? <laughs> so yeah. So and I'm like, oh, I don't mind moving on and having a look. So I basically left and then started pursuing computers and stuff. And my auntie Lorraine, Uncle Paul, one of the the brothers who leather workers, his missus used to work in BT. Okay. And she said there's a there's like a computer re job. She didn't know every Everything back then, if it involved a computer, <laughs> that's what you want to do, <laughs> isn't it? You know? and I'm like, yeah, I was, I was more into art and computers, but I thought, it's computers, that's different. Yeah, let's give that a go. Yeah. So I ended up going into telecom and doing computers. It was project management, really. It was more systems analyst. It was about, they'd just been privatized. Mm. So it was like, oh, just about to be privatized. I think we were trying to get the company more efficient. So it was around 89, 90. And it was like, they hired a load of people around the country, like young people. Yeah. God knows how I got the job. Eight and a half thousand people went for the job. Wow. Yeah. God, I, I said, what qualification? I've got maths, English, and computers, and the rest I didn't do too well on. Yeah. You know, and I've got nothing else. And there's people there with degrees and everything, and they give it to me. And I was like, what? I was just, it was mental. I just thought I didn't stand a chance. What, what, you know, why, why did they give it to you? Like, what, what I, did they the, think? The me, so the, the chap who interviewed me, he said the main reason was your enthusiasm. Mm. Like you've been taught this ethic of customer care and going the extra mile. And it said they were the things that really stood out to us. And we can't teach that. Yeah. We can teach you how to, you know, you've got a basic understanding of everything else. But no one knows about telecoms and digital exchanges and stuff. Anyhow, mm. it's like even if they've done a degree in programming, you've got the basics. That's just as good as them. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. It's like you're all coming from the same place, really. Both of you know nothing. You know, so I'm like, oh, okay. So, yeah, I, I, anyhow, so I started doing this work and I wrote all kinds of systems for them. One employee of the year. Yeah. Yeah. Say Telecom 19 million quid. Wow. Yeah. Wow. For, for a, a, some computer software help, right? Wow. So they developed it and took it on. It was basically a system, the, the, the start of a system called Work Manager, yeah. which is basically like it took out kind of the need there was a really difficult job in managing like repair jobs and stuff and you had a lot of people crossing over like traveling around and it could have been a lot more efficient but the, the human brain just couldn't cope with mm. the complexity of the situation and i was like i could write a computer program to do this so we did a test on 200 people in bolton it saved like a quarter of a million quid wow. and that was just in guarantee money that mm. we paid out to businesses because we didn't fix the telephone line in time yeah. Like this was real money we saved, wow. not just like some fictional. Oh yes, we've saved. Blah, blah, blah. It, was so it was like it was yeah. real pounds. It was like a big drop in the amount of like it was massive. Wow. And they were like, oh my god, how have we done this? <laughs> so they took the basic concept and they spent a fortune. They must have spent like I heard something like they'd spent something like twenty million on the system and the computer to run <laughs> it to do it nationally. 
but I like to think that the original idea of that was mine. Yeah. You know, the, the system, I mean, I could never have done that. Mm. You know, that's just way beyond my capability, but it was it was nice, you know. And the, that, that later system saved them £90 million. Pound. They then sold the software <laughs> to British Gas <laughs> for three and a half billion. Wow. Yeah, incredible, isn't it? You, need to, get, you need to chase some royalties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's another story. <laughs> but anyhow, yeah. Yeah, um, so I, I did that. I then left Telecom because I wanted to do more with small businesses. The bureaucracy there was really difficult for me. Yeah, I was creating. I was getting into trouble. Yeah, I, I, I built the first I- internet server in Telecom with a um, with like a lots of people were having trouble finding out who to get in touch with, contact numbers, keeping stuff yeah. updated. Internal directories were a mess. So I built an online computer system to do it, and people could go in, take ownership edit it update it really great it worked but didn't ask for permission yeah and and that was a problem you know that was a real problem so i got a slap on the wrist for that because it saved so much money <laughs> you know so your entrepreneurial uh, yeah it's just like yeah let's do that you know yeah. what i mean this is great so yeah they took it down everyone cried because they took it down and then they spent two years trying to trying to work out how to do it their way yeah and it was like it's just like you just just idiots. Yeah. I just thought, you're absolute idiot. Cut your nose, spite your face. You've got a system that works. Leave it up. You know, brand it the way you'd brand it or change, change the language to yeah. the language you would use. Get it on style or on brand and use it. What You know, it's just like, oh my God. Because you're not doing it for you. You were doing it to help everyone. Yeah, 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 totally, yeah. So, yeah, and, and it was just, there was lots of things like that where I always find it easier to ask permission afterwards yes so, you know yeah ask for forgiveness ask for for, permission, yeah, yeah. That, that's that's the phrase i was looking for and that's my mentality let's yeah. just do it and see what happens um we're smart enough to pick up the, you know as long as we're intelligent about what we're doing in the first place you yeah. know um and it just didn't fit in a big so i wanted to work with smaller companies so i left with the idea of building little kind of management systems for managing like resources in small companies because the, the cost of the software they, obviously they couldn't go and buy work manager for three and a half billion pounds yeah just you know from telecom so i'm thinking 500 i could build like a client server op- operation they could log on they could have people i'm um, off then right we need to cover them at this skill you can't go away. and this stuff's only just happening now yeah and this was 1994 wow and he's going in talking to companies and going, I'm going to set this up on a website. And they go, oh, well, you do websites. <laughs> oh, right, okay, yeah, yeah, cool. And I'm like, no, I don't do websites. I do client server applications on the web, you know what I mean? And people just didn't get it. It was like, I ended up having to like, it was just too advanced. I was going to say, people you didn't understand. so far ahead of your it time. It just didn't, didn't, it didn't work. Mm. It was, it was you, being first to the market is not the best thing all the time. Mm. It's timing. Timing, yeah. Yeah, totally. Like, that's the biggest thing I learned. It's all about timing. Mm. You can be too far advanced. And sometimes you, what you need to do is look at where you are now, look at when that would be right, yeah. and then build a roadmap to there. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Rather than kind of like, no, this is too advanced now, but let's keep that in the roadmap. Yeah. And let's work our way towards that. And what do them steps in between look like? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. then build a business as part of the journey rather than, you know. Anyhow, yeah. that was something I, I found really, really important to me at that time because the business failed, mm. you know, and it was kind of, we got into computers and then people go, oh, you do what? You do computers, don't you? Yeah, I need me CD drive fixing. I'm mm. like, at that time, there was an umbrella of computers. There wasn't all these distinct different parts. Yeah. Like, no, I built I'm building websites. I mean, that's a step down yeah. from what I'm, I'm capable of. And now you got me fixing CD drives because I need the money, mm. you know. So I ended up getting into all kind. Of, I ran a computer sales business, basically building bespoke computers for people. Mm. I just didn't enjoy it, didn't like it. And then Dell's hitting the market with really great products, really great price, and just killing us yeah. on price. We're like, well, can get this from Dell. And I'm like, I've just educated you into the exact product you need. Yeah. Saying so you need this for your graphics card, you need that for that, what you're doing, you don't need that. You need this, you need that, right? I can build that for you, it'd be this much, and then we'll go on and go, but I can get this from Dell. That's yeah. almost the same spec. I'm like, dude. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so it, it, it killed us, and, and, and that business, I, I just had to shut it down. We weren't making money. Mm. I was left with a lot of debt after shutting it down, but... It was where it was, and I, I just got into 
kind of focusing purely on web development and online marketing. So okay. companies then, so we, they've drifted too much into hardware and I thought, no, let's, now's the time to get into web development, online marketing. Yeah. The time's right, about three, four years later. So got into that. And we were killing it, you know, at the time Google was just kind of starting up and it was like, I could get people to number one on Google overnight in natural SERPs. Mm. You know, there, was, there wasn't many people that could do that at that time. Yeah. You know, and you can't, it's impossible to do now. Yeah. You know, but literally I was getting like, Courier companies coming to me going, Keith, there's my login details. There's two grand. Yeah. Do an optimization for me. And like by tomorrow morning, they'd be number one for saying day <laughs> courier in the UK. Amazing. They'd be like, what? And the business, the phones would be off the hook. Yeah. And they'd be like, this is mental. Yeah. And then they'd be going, can I have a testimonial? And they go, yeah. And then they'd be telling everyone and the phone wouldn't stop ringing. So my prices went up. Nice. So I was charging like an opt a site optimization. I was charging like ten grand. Wow. And it was taking me. Wow. Not that long because I knew <laughs> what I was doing, you know. Yeah. So I was, I was killing it, you know. And we were doing other things, and then it was giving me time then to play, and I was writing software that was kind of analysing images and graphics and like there was things we were doing with with the the optimization. Like we were looking at Google. And we knew I had a a guy that used to kind of so i'm a my core language is Perl. yeah i write Perl. i use a pair programming so basically have a navigator and a pilot so someone shadows you whilst you program yeah and basically it takes you to an, another level of coding because you know someone's constantly watching yeah and they're debugging as you're writing yeah. so it it's a it, the cost of development's a little bit more but the, the speed of development is about 40% faster than the normal programmer okay. because it's being debugged as you go. Wow. And then you get to discuss stuff, but you both understand all the code. So two coders, basically, one just sitting there watching. Yeah. And are we doing that? Is that the best way to do that? Da -da -da. Incredible way to program, yeah. really fast. More costly, but speeds it up. Yeah, know? it seems very agile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's incredible, yeah. So James, my navigator, he'd be like, we knew the inside out of like how Google worked when we'd be programming stuff. We we there was back then there was probably only like maybe fifty, sixty different elements that built up the Google yeah. algorithm. I think now there's I, I wouldn't even like to has, hazard a guess. <laughs> We're probably looking at thousands of different things that create this algorithm. It's almost like a you know the complexity of the human mind. Yeah, you know, all these different inputs and outputs creating this overall forming the air uh, picture of what's actually going on you know yeah um but the beauty of that was is we knew what to tweak what not to tweak we knew how to improve it mm. so there was things we could do that we we, we we like we yahoo saw what we were doing and they they were failing in the search engine market they had a a, a, a thing called overture okay which was like their version of google ads mm. or google adwords as it used to be back yeah. then um and they came to us and said, "Listen, we want we we want to we want to use some of your tech. We can see what you're doing here. Mm. This is really clever. We want to use it." And part of that was like we knew how to optimize ads for pages, so we wrote a bot very similar to the Google Spider that went into a page and could tell us what that page was about, but also used it image analysis as well, which I wrote my own engine. Because I was into computer graphics, I was writing my own computer art software and stuff. Yeah. And then obviously reverse engineering that gave me a good insight into how to look at a picture, mm. disassemble it and go, this is this, and take general rules of form. Wow. Um, so Yahoo came to us and they were like, yeah. So we said, listen, you can have it. Okay. And they were like, what? I said, yeah, all we want is you install it on some of your network. Mm. And we'll take a, a share of the extra you get. So we managed to negotiate the lion's share of profit. So we got 60% of the increase in profit and, and Yahoo took 40. <laughs> yeah. So they, they obviously didn't give us access to the whole ad network to start with. Mm. Um, so they give us access to quite a bit of it. And then basically we're improving. Ad, ad, the, the ads they're showing on their, their ad network were a lot more relevant, like yeah. massively, like they were like, oh my God, this is incredible. I think, you know, the actual ad revenue generated, we did a trial on, I think, something like 2,000 sites or something, it was a really small number, 
and they were just like I think they've doubled it by about yeah I think I think it, it we hit about eighty percent on increased revenue wow. and sixty percent of that money was ours wow. and then they increased the network size and then they got more and more involved so that went on for about eighteen months yeah. with them increasing the network size and the, all the time they were trying to reverse engineer what we were doing yeah. which they eventually did. And then they cut us out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> During that time, I think we made, I mean, our share of the revenue for Jim and I was like 1.8 million. Wow. Yeah. Most of that went in tax. Paying service. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That is so clever the way you did that. Yeah, though. That yeah. was it. How did you, how did you come up with, did you know it was going to go that way? Is that why you negotiated a percentage well, rather than? I would read, I mean, both. Both James and I were big into reading autobiographies and stuff, and it was kind of like you look at like them key moments when people make it. You look at Bill Gates with IBM and MS DOS. Mm. It's like, yeah, just take it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, cool. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it can grow so much quicker when you give something away. Yeah. You know, and it's like, yeah, this could be massive. Let's like, see if we can get a percentage rather than, you know what I mean? Yeah. We didn't realize how quick to be able to reverse engineer the software. That was the downfall. Mm. So they'd actually done it within a year, but I think they felt a bit guilty. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know? And it was like, it was like, they was like, yeah, and then what about this? And what about that? Okay, that's quite simple, that, isn't it? Yeah. You know, to them guys, they're really smart, more, a lot smarter than just James and I. You know, yeah. we're like, we're more agile than anything. You know, that was mm. the, the, the beauty of it, was our speed of development. Yeah. Was that, you know, it takes them months to do a change. It's like, yeah, done. Ten, yeah. Minutes, ten minutes later, you know the code, like the back of your hand. Mm. You know, it's like, oh, we need to change that. Okay, that, yeah, I've done that. You know, what? We only talked it. Yeah, I've done it. Yeah. It's my laptop, haven't I? You know? They have to sign things off in Yahoo and oh, it, like a again, waterfall model or something. Well, yeah. the beauty of that is the system was ours and we didn't. We tried not to give them too much into ah, that. Okay. So we ran our own server farm yeah. and that was where a lot of the cost came in. But we were still making money. Yeah. But we had, you know... 700 servers running and stuff like that you know all cloud based but still money and it was like okay yeah we've got a challenge here and, and then you got tax and all that kind of stuff to pay yeah you got debts from a failing computer business previously mm. as well so i came out where i was able to buy a house which i was really happy with <laughs> you know <laughs> <laughs> so but that's where i stood you know and then i was like okay let's go back and do some consultancy and stuff like that and i was looking at things and i was like and and, and I've, at this point, I've still been doing graphics work and mm. working with the Satchel business. Most of that work back then was, it wasn't Satchels. It was guitar straps. It was this. It was like, Keith, you need some artwork doing for this. Could you yeah. do that on this strap for us? Work out how we can, yeah, I can do that for you. Or Keith, we're looking at setting up, a, like they asked me to do this branding for the pet product side of the business because that was really booming. They mm. do dog collars and leads. We did all that. And they wanted me to do the brand. They, they, they had some branding done. And they weren't happy with it. Mm. So I, I looked into it and I was like, and again, this was really early. This is like 90, I think 98. And I said to them, I said, listen, the problem you've got is your brand's called BBD Pet Products. And it's it's kind of tailored towards you, like your British Bulldog, which is nice because they're all British made and stuff yeah. like that. And that kind of bomber jacket, I've got, I've got a, I've got a bull mastiff or I've got, you know, and it's that kind of macho kind of look, yeah. which guys are generally kind of gravitate towards. I says, but that's the wrong place in the market where you want to be. Mm. Right now, you need to be looking, if you're British made, you need to be looking at luxury. Mm. And then guys aren't going to spend 400 quid on a dog collar. It's handmade and beautiful. They say, so you, you're compromising, you're cutting down your skill. Mm. And just using the basics of it to produce a product that's cheap but works it's good quality good value for money yeah but that's not where the market is it says you need to be getting into high-end stuff like proper luxury for dogs people spend more on dogs and pets than you will on kids mm. and they just laughed at me and i'm like i'm going you need diamantes you need this you want this you want that and this is before your poochies and your ted barkers and all them high-end luxury yeah. brands even existed and I put this business plan together for them, and they just they just didn't listen to me because Uncle Barry and Uncle Steve and everyone they they, they used to change me nappies. You know, yeah. they don't look at me as like this is a guy who's been out in the world and understands a little bit about brands, a bit about the corporate world, a bit about where the money is and where it's flowing, and or has all that knowledge. Like yeah. I, I used to know all the searches, 
you used to know all the searches, you used to run a search network. Yeah. It's like the amount of knowledge when you sit and data analyze all that, that, that insight that gives you into the world mm. and what's going on. Yeah. Incredible. So it's like, they look at it and I thought, yeah, this is, because it was, it's an existing business to them and the risk of them changing and taking that away when it's putting food on plates. Yeah. And it's like, we've been through a lot of tough times. Mm. Do you know what I mean? They're not going to, you know, they don't know me, you know, they know me, but they know a different me, yeah. not the person I'd grown to be. Yeah. So it just didn't work, you know, and, and there's, there was a few things over the time, it's like guitar straps and stuff, and it's like, yeah, they just don't get what I'm doing. Mm. They think, oh, he's great at that, we'll get into it, and then I tell them what they need to do, but they don't listen, mm. you know, and that's the, the problem. So we wanted to get back involved, and Uncle Barry had said, like, okay, well, I've been making these bags for this lady, like, you know, the satchels, yeah. we do. And he said, yeah. He says, well, our kids were mad on Harry Potter and we'd made some bags for them. They went into school and all the other kids went, oh my God, Harry Potter bags. <laughs> <laughs> she contacted me and got 10 off me. I did her a bulk deal for like wow. 600 pounds plus VAT or whatever. And uh, she sold them in an afternoon. And it's like, they're going really crazy. It's like, can you come and help us look at this? So we came in and we went, Gail and I, you know, and we went, we, we could put another business plan together. The good thing with this product is it's no money to them now. Mm. But it was Julie from Cambridge Satchels, yeah? Yeah. Who we were initially doing some prototypes and samples for. Yeah. And the the, the, the challenge was is, is that we didn't want to get into that business. She she had this, she's a really smart lady. Mm. done amazing work for the industry, like, the leather satchel co industry in the UK, in the world, wouldn't exist without her. Okay. Full stop. Yeah. Like amazing. I remember drive seeing and the passion. YouTube advert. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. And and I think that Google advert really, really helped right the way through the Olympics and like that really drove it to a new level. I think yeah. it was two thousand twelve. Yeah. The Olympics two thousand twelve yeah. and that advert was shown. It's like Google business mm. and it used her as a case study. Yeah. It was fantastic. Gail and I were like looking and going, yeah, this is, I mean, this is our, this is where we started, mm. but it's, it, it's no business. They get like occasionally eating college phone and not going to need 30 bags or mm. some book shop in whatever going, can I have five book bags or can I have some music cases yeah. or whatever? So it wasn't a core production to us. It wasn't really, we could take a risk with it and they wouldn't mind. Yeah. And that's where, why we made the decision to get back involved, you know? So we set up kind of, a brand idea so it was about taking this and the, the brand back then was it was business to business yeah i mean okay we were doing a little bit of retail from people who knew us yeah you know but it was it was it was mainly business to business and we were like we should really show off what we're good at mm. and i wanted to show barry the the, the, the flip side of don't compete on price mm. don't try and compete with the chinese i know you're really efficient and amazing at doing what you do and you can the what your quality price offer offering can't be beaten. Yeah. Cannot be beaten. You know, when they produce a, a quality product at their prices, you look at the dog collars and all that that they produce using that same price quality model, they're amazing value. Mm. But dirt cheap as well, you know? Yeah. I said, flip that on its head and let's look at doing something that's a bit more artisan, a bit more bespoke. Mm but not losing the roots of the company. So it's still a utility product. It's still an everyday bag yeah. that you get. You, you should batter it and you should wreck it and let it get worn and battered because that tells a story. So, yeah. and I said, let's give the user an experience. Let's wrap it in brown paper and twine and string and make it magical. You know what I mean? And so that's what we did initially. So we, we gave them this, yeah, you pick a bag, you pick a color, we'll make it for you. And then we used to hand wrap them all in brown paper and twine, put them in a box and send them off, all handwritten notes and everything. So initially, it was a slightly different experience to where we are now. We've, we've refined that and made it a bit more commercial and scalable. Mm. Um, but we st it's still all about an experience, about people coming to us and getting a, a bespoke tailoring experience yeah. at an affordable price. You know, if you went to... to you know, Dunhill or someone and try to get the, the experience we offer, you'd be paying thousands of pounds. Mm. We do it for a couple hundred. Mm. And you get a, a really awesome product for it as well, you know what I mean? So yeah. I think what we offer in 
that kind of thing is, is, you know, for me, I think it's unique in the world. What we offer is, I've seen a space, I'm going, I'm going there. We've got the competitors, like Cambridge is great because they bring popularity of the style. Yeah. But it's like they make 2,000 bags and sell them. We keep leather in stock. Mm. You tell us what you want to make, we make it for you. It's a different business model. People look at us and go, oh, this is just, this is like the Cambridge Satchel Company. I'm going, well, first off, we were around earlier. Mm. But I don't mind that. That's nice. Just shows me every time someone says that, how much work Julie's done to make the style popular. You know, because without her, the other 12 or 13 satchel makers in the UK would not exist. There mm. wouldn't be an industry. Yeah. It'd just be some crazy guy in Liverpool making them everyone <laughs> on them, you know what I mean? <laughs> and that, and that, that, that's it, you know? Yeah. So it, it's really, really different. So we got back in and it was all about experience, about this real high-end luxury feel, mm. but an affordable price because we're very good at what we do and we know how to make great value products because that's where... Mm. The family's always been. It, uh, everything we do, every brand we own, every brand we make, it's all about value for money. Mm. It's like it might be at different points across the price, quality scale, but incredible value for money. And yeah, that, that's where we sit. That's what represents our family. You know, if you if Hanshaw's was something you kind of had to, so what is the Hanshaw's family about? It's about getting value for money, full stop. Yeah, and that that's that's in our genes. You know. We've got Jewish in our family, and it's like you know, it's like my, my pops was married to my nan, my nan's Levy. It's like we've got strong Jewish blood, and ah. it's like it's all about value for money, finding out what's the best way to do this, what's the best way to do that, you know. Yeah. So it's kind of like pops is a cockney originally, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, but yeah, it's it, it's interesting, and that and that's where we sit, and we're now looking at where we are and. The, pr- the challenge is the Leather Satchel Co. brand, it's, it's like a, a lovely little boutique brand where mm. we, we do really special things. I mean, it's testimony to what we do when you go on Trustpilot and you get something like a 9.8 out of 10 or something. Mm. And it's like, yeah, it, it gives me some peace that all this hard work, all this effort in trying to do everything, you know. Like initially, it was just me and Gail. We built... We built it from just two two of us, you know yeah. what I mean? It was like everything. It was like we were doing photography. We didn't even build a website. We we, we built it Yeah. as an experience. We thought, let's experiment without a website. Let's try and do it just on social media. Okay. And this was like 2009, you know, and it's like, can we do this? This would be interesting. You can't, mm. but you just can't get enough information into 140 characters, yeah. you know what I mean? It's just... But it was an interesting experiment to see what you can yeah. do on social media. What well, you, you might be do. again ahead of your time there because they're saying that's where the future's going. People are not going to go on websites anymore and they're just going to shop on social media. Yeah, I think it is. I think social media back then was, it was just too restrictive. Yeah. You, you couldn't have a shop, whereas now Facebook has a shopping platform. Yeah, and Instagram and, as, and Instagram well. as yeah. well. You know, and it's like you look at that and you think, yeah. And again, it's one of them. It's like, we I clearly understand that we could sit there nowadays. Yeah. Because I've tried it and I knew what was lacking then. Yeah. That's now available now. And I, if I built the business again, I could probably do it without a website. Yeah. But then you've always got the people like me, the slightly older jet. I always tend to think of myself as like, I'm almost a baby boomer, but with a millennial brain. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So I, I span this boundary between two areas because... I'm kind of, I'm a lot older than most people who are into this tech industry. Mm. You know, I'm approaching 50 and it's like, okay, so, but I've got this real tech knowledge as yeah. well and, and I'm not afraid to try out new things and it's like, okay, well, let's do this and let's do that and I'm always following what's going on. I'm self-taught. Yeah. You know, I've not, I've not been to, you know, so the way I do things can sometimes seem a bit alien to when you go into a professional, pro- and it's like, oh. Just learn something. That's great. Yeah, you know, because you come in, you do, you're doing your things your own maverick way. Mm. Oh, we don't do it like that. Do it, oh, and I'll I'll pick up things then and I'll take that on board and go. Yeah. Oh, that's great. But you know, the way I've been doing's been working. But obviously, when people are doing it, kind of like and sharing knowledge a lot more. Like I'm in a little dark black room doing things. <laughs> like, oh, let's try this, <laughs> and you just get into a habit. And some of them habits can be quite bad. Mm. Do you know what I mean? But it makes it work, and it's quick. 
you know, well, I just did have, we did have all our own branding, all our own marketing, all our own posters, all our own PR, all our own package design, development, everything, colours, leather, product design, everything wow. in this company is Gail and I now. Wow. Apart from the original black and brown satchels that we used to do, everything is us. You know, wow. it's kind of, and that, and we still do that today. We get involved in everything. Right, right to front line, let's mm. talk to customers. Let's see what challenges they have and let's see what, oh, that's interesting. Like we learn things as things go on. Yeah. It's like people are changing and it's like new bag designs. Like we have some ideas for some new bags, but we're also looking at bringing back that Hanshaw's name again okay. and developing a slightly higher end, luxury, more luxury brand. Mm. You know, so where we sit there is great. But there ain't no Hermes bag. Mm. I'll be straight with you. You know, but an Hermes bag is thirty thousand pound. Value for money wise, I don't think it's worth it. I could probably make a bag better as or as good as quality as mm. an Hermes bag for probably under two grand, mm. maybe. And then certainly in comparable with you kind of I mean the bag's on the market now. The, the, the challenge you've got is you have some beautiful, cherished brands in the UK like Mulberry. Mm. used to do most of the production here. There was a clear style to what they used to do. Now they've moved a lot of production abroad. Mm. They're trying to fit in with the skill sets yeah. that are available abroad. And you see the brand change and moving from where it was. Yeah. And, 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 and the public sees that as well. And the Chinese are great. They know how to make and break things down. You'll never be able to keep compete mm. with them on price, ever unless you go into Vietnam or Cambodia or somewhere like that. Yeah. But that's not what it's about. There's a vacuum created where British brands have left mm. the UK manufacture, where there's a difference in, like I was talking about, that pride, that magic has not been instilled in the product. Yeah. It's a, my, you can show me a Michael Kors bag, show me a Marc Jacobs bag, show me Coach, whatever. Stick them next to each other, take the brands off, swap them around, you wouldn't know any mm. difference because they're all using the, the same factories, the same workforce, the same skill sets. Yep. There's no DNA in them anymore, no brand DNA. Mm. You can't look at it and go, oh, you know, the, the beauty of the good brands, the real good brands like your Prada, your Louis Vuitton, your Hermes, is they own their own production. Mm. They own their own factories. They don't just outsource. Mm. So there's techniques and things that only they do. Yeah. And there's, there's a quality in their products that's different to just brands that I call factory surfers, they mm. basically go to the cheapest buyer. The good quality products, but they're just the bland. Yeah. You know, they're just mundane. It's just like, yeah, we'll do this, yeah, we'll do that. And it's all about money and name and they're just brainwashing you. Yeah, these are the bags. You should buy this. Yeah. Like, buy, no, buy this. I don't want that. Buy this, buy this, buy that. Yeah. Okay, I'll buy it. Leave me alone. Yeah. You know, and it's like pigeonholing people and 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 I'm like I come up from a bespoke and go, well, you tell me what you want. Yeah. I'll make it for you. You know what I mean? It's like, what? I'm, I'm trying to educate people into this concept. No, we keep leather in stock. Yeah. Not bags. You know, it's like, and it's like, I'm trying to be really transparent. I'm trying to create a process where I want this process to look like this. The future of our business is this. Mm. You come in, you go online, there's a design tool, you spec your bag in a sketch, yeah, you then watch it getting built over social media. Wow. Yeah, all that process is embedded into a time lapse movie that's embedded on a chip of the bag. Yeah, along with who did what, where all the materials came from. Yeah, and it then starts telling a history of that bag. Wow. Like you can tag a photo here. It is. It come back for repair in eighteen eighty. Da da da. Did this come back? It got so battered we converted it into a notebook for your great great grandson he now uses it to hold his 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 digital notebook or what you, you know what i mean it's yeah. like that's the future of the business so when you get it it's like you scan it it, it authenticity proofs it with a chip yeah it shows you the bag being made you can tell it's real and you you can say oh believe it or not or or this product this wallet used to be a bag that used to belong to Elton John <laughs> or whatever, you know yeah. what I mean? And that kind of thing. So you've got this real provenance of what's going on. I think that is kind of the future of where businesses like ours sit. Yeah. And that, that's the epitome of, of British manufacturing. Mm. That's innovation tied in with tradition. Yeah. You know, and that's what I feel the British luxury industry is about. Mm. 
it's about that innovation and uh, and i'm really really lucky to have landed in a position that allows me to take advantage of my skills yeah. like being half good at computers <laughs> and half good at leather work <laughs> you know <laughs> but, but you know it kind of it, it gives me a unique opportunity to combine these two worlds yeah. and create something very very unique you know but so many questions that have just come from <laughs> everything. I have a hundred and million questions. I obviously can't ask them all, but the more and more you talk, you're so clever. You're a true entrepreneur. You're obviously very forward thinking, and you can see things and the way the world's going. A couple of things you mentioned there, where you just seem to be so far ahead of your time throughout your life. Is that is is this in your bloodline? Is it genetics? Is it just the way you were born? Do you do you read like what what is it? What do you do? What's your secret? Oh, thank you very much. Very <laughs> flattering. I think it's more luck than anything. Um, we all create our own luck, though. That's the thing. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's funny. I always play on that. I, my middle name. So it's it's Keith Eugene Hanshaw. Okay. And and the Eugene's from the Jewish side yeah. of the family. So, but Eugene actually translates to born lucky. Yeah. So I always say funnily enough. Oh, like, God, you're really lucky. I say, yeah, it's my middle name. More <laughs> lucky. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but yeah, I, I I do think I've been genuinely lucky, but I also think luck is one of them. You've got to be there at that mm. time. You've got to have the skills. And, and there's luck, mm. but then there's also an element of being ready for when that luck yeah. happens. You know, if you're going to hit a home run, there's like, well, you can have a ball thrown at you, but you've got to have the bat ready to hit it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of... There's a lot of preparation that goes into being lucky, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, so it, it's having them opportunities. And so you talk about vision, and but you've got to look at, like, when I left Telecom, I didn't see that I was far too early. Mm. I saw where it was going and thought the marketplace was ready then. It wasn't. Yeah. I thought people could change that quickly. They can't. Mm. You know, uh, so there's, there's, a, there's also a lack of naivety or, sorry, there's a lack of insight which gives me a naivety. There is some naivety in the way I do business yeah that i think you know you kind of when you don't know someone you fill in the gaps in their personality with your own personality mm. so it's funny it's like a lot of people think i'm too trusting of people mm. because i fill in the gaps with the way the people around me and my experience of people like i'm really lucky to have a great crowd of people around me that i trust and i love but then when i meet someone i if I don't know them that well, I fill in the gaps with them personality traits. Yeah. And that makes me a bit vulnerable at times. Okay. Do you know what I mean? So I get ripped off every now and then. I get people taking advantage. But I, there's also the point of, like, not letting that change yet because I don't yeah. want it to. I, I'm happy with the person I am. You know, and if that means I get ripped off now and then and we lose a bit of money and somebody, then so be it. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Where does that come from? Um, huh. so when I was a kid, a guy, a, a guy got me into uh, self-improvement. Okay. I, I, one of my best mates started this kind of self-improvement course, and I was curious what he was doing. Paul Anderson, his name was, he works in York now, um, got a little shop down the shambles, I believe. But anyhow, um... And he got me into self-improvement. Now, he, he didn't take it on as much as I did, but I had things in me that I wasn't happy with. Mm -hmm. Like, the way I responded emotionally to certain situations and things were not... I was not... I was I like, look back at myself and I'd hate myself. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'd be like, oh, I don't like that. And then getting into things like neuro-linguistic programming and stuff like that, it kind of gave me a way to change that habit yeah. and understand it was just... A bad bit of coat. It's like to me, I could relate to it. It's like that's a bug. Yeah, I can fix that. Okay, so here's how I do it. The brain works quite quite differently. I've got to reprogram it over and over and over and over again. Mm. But I can actually change the way that neuron fires. I can say if I believe this, I can change it and make it be like this. Mm. And then, so then you look at traits of people and you analyze them and you're thinking that's really not how are, how are they thinking when they behave how do they handle that person talking to them like that yeah because i probably back then i'd have probably blown up yeah do you know what i mean i've gone listen this is just outrageous you know you don't speak to people like this and you know and 
because it, it that's that's part of my passion as well is injustice and yeah not seeing things that are right and unfair the world isn't fair live with it deal with it and all that kind of stuff but it's kind of that passion seeing something not right in the world and wanting to make it right or wanting to make it better is what makes an entrepreneur mm. you know that's that's really what kind of that's the difference isn't it having that fight if you haven't got the fight you can't be an entrepreneur mm. you've got to have something about you yeah it's like no i'm not but it's then learning how to not just react and fight like people like i see people who are really passionate and that sometimes that can come off as aggression yes they just need to learn to channel it and they could be so effective in their lives if they just learn to reprogram themselves mm. and channel that and become like really kind of different people because i've been there i've been that person yeah I've repro let's reprogram let's channel that let's put this let's drive and then you just it's just drive then it's like right go 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 okay yeah i can handle this get these mosquitoes out the way let's just focus let's you know what i mean and it's like yeah let's go we're doing it and it's like they're just nags leaving behind and yeah you know and i, I have all these like little things and anchors that i use to help me like reprogram myself yeah. so a lot of that comes from self-improvement a lot of it comes from self-improvement books i listen to an audio book every day okay every day oh so i i do a lot of driving with the nature of the work i've got a workshop in heighton i live over the water because that's where my wife's from yeah her family's there um I, i've got a shop in the Albert dock you know so it, it's got and we do a lot of traveling so i drive a lot and then when i'm in the car mm. it's like if i just want to listen to music i'll put radio city on but a lot of the time it's like yeah plug the phone in let's put audible on let's yeah. listen to an audio book or let's listen to a podcast or you know and and that's what i do like podcasts like i love listening to podcasts about like in interviews like what we're doing yeah. now and getting into people's brains and yeah. what you know and see i always look at them as like buffets there's like a lot of stuff you won't like but occasionally oh what's that Oh, yeah that's lovely that <laughs> stuff buying these with oregano yeah. you know and it's like yeah i love them cool and you just take that one bit and then you end up with a plate full of goodies you know yeah. <laughs> and it's like and that's where you end up you know so do you have a, a, a book a favorite book that you, you would recommend anyone read um no but i have got a favorite yeah so the Strangest Secret by Earl Nightingale. Ah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so... Um, it's on YouTube, you can get it on YouTube. Yeah, I think you can as well, yeah. I think it was the first ever kind of audio tape yeah. of self-improvement. Um, yeah, and I, I think I think that's something I revert to, try and listen to that, you know, at least a couple of times every year, just yeah. reinforcing that basic... I mean, it's maybe a little bit outdated and a lot more advanced and, and more specific on exactly yeah. what's going on in the But human. the philosophy of it... The philosophy is, so is, is I, still accurate I now. I burned that to a CD and had it in my car and I listened to it yeah, uh, yeah. all the time. I, I, yeah, yeah. A lot, I loved it, yeah. used to listen to it five times a day. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> you know? It's like, yeah, you can, I think there's a condensed version that's down to, like, 30 minutes. Yes, yeah. I think I think I think it was kind of like the basis of Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich as well, yeah. which is just classic kind of self improvement kind yeah. of you know entrepreneurial. You know, they're they're the classics of the entrepreneurial world, mm. aren't they? They, uh, you know, your great expectations, <laughs> and then, uh, Henry V and all that kind of. Yeah. They're the classic books in the in the you know oh, getting away from class classic literature, yeah. but going into kind of entrepreneurial literature and 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 brain mastery yeah that's where they start you know that's where everything is based upon them, them yeah. foundations you know well i know you've got a business to run but i could keep you here all day so i'm just going to ask you one question it seems like you live breathe and eat work so what do you do to relax when you're not when you're not working um yeah i go to gym okay so i go to gym twice a week that's quite nice kind of gives you time to think as well when you can't actually take action sometimes you can be thinking you're like oh, i'll just go and do that and i'll just yeah. go and get this done this allows you to kind of the one thing we have control about is our thoughts and it kind of gives you a chance to kind of organize things look at where you are look at what's gone on it's like you can and it also builds willpower as well mm -hmm. you know what i mean so i like to go to the gym also like walking um so i've got like 
my, my missus and I went out for like a two and a half hour walk last night, you know, at like 11, like, oh, let's go for a walk, <laughs> you know, so we, we just went down the, the river and went for a walk along it came out, I love that, just getting out, love nature, mm. um, like a, like, like, like a craft beer, okay, a nice gin, <laughs> so <laughs> not too much, we have, then we're getting older now, so we have this rule, four drinks, four times a week, <laughs> <You know? laughs> so it's kind of, it's nice and squared off, but it, it works for us, you know what I mean, so yeah. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, not not much really. Um, you know, our life. I'm I'm lucky because I got a really supportive family. Mm. They understand what we do, and you know, we have we have older kids, and so they know. You know, we're lucky to be in this position where, you know, we spend a lot of time working. We do spend a lot. Of, you know, my my av my average week is probably between seventy to eighty five hours. Wow. You know, but I enjoy it. Yeah. You know, so it, it's different, you know. Um, we have a house to run and everything like that. But, uh, you know, I don't think, I always say, you know, it, it, it's that balance between work, rest and play. It's like work for eight hours, rest for eight hours, play for eight hours. Mm. But if you can make the play something to do with your work, yeah, then that becomes 16 hours then. Mm. It's like, actually, you can do 16 hours a day. It's like work, this is the stuff I've got to do to get in the business, to get the business running and doing. Yeah. But then I can go and design a new bag. And that's not what that's play then. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Oh, go play in the laser cutter and let's go up with this. And, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and skills, or I can build it. Let's build it. Let's see if we can program this to do this. Yeah. And if you can do that, it's like that 16 hours is nothing. Mm. You know, you got that work, rest, play element, but they're all combined and in, yeah. and in harmony, you know? Brilliant. Thank you so, so much. That was yeah. fantastic. I really enjoyed that. It's a pleasure. It's nice talking to you. Really nice talking to you. If anyone wants to reach out to you, can I put the, your email yeah, or yeah, your contact yeah. details? Yeah, yeah, yeah. com. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyone can get in touch all the time. I only answer emails twice a day, though. Yes, so I've seen yeah, that, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Tim Ferriss, I'm guessing you picked it that up from. It is Tim Ferriss, yeah. <laughs> if if, if anyone, anyone uses it, it's brilliant. You should really, really use it. It helps focus. Um, gets rid of all them distractions, yeah. you know what I mean? So it, it's really nice, yeah. And then people can still get through if, if there's urgent stuff, yeah. you know what I mean? So you're not saying like, oh, no, I'm not available, <laughs> don't talk to me. But just, you know, let's do things, let's let's have some space, yeah. you know? Yeah, a lot more productive. Yeah. But thank you so much, I you're appreciate welcome. your time. Real pleasure, real pleasure.